Yeah, so I have uh, uh, put together some uh, information about social media uh, with my particular perspective. So I'm going to start with this slide. Who knows who this man is? Connie. Okay, Co Joseph Connie, who knows who he is? Raise your hand. Everybody? Uh, Basically everybody? Okay, who has seen a YouTube video about this man? Okay, almost everybody. Good. Um, who has done, who has lifted a finger to do anything about what this man is about. Anybody? One person? Hmm? Who has done anything, whether it's to make, donate money or uh, work hard to, you know, uh, uh, I don't know, put together a community to fight against Joseph Kony? Uh, Edgar is apparently one person. He's very passionate about this cause. Anybody else? Yeah, what have you done? Um, we had an like, online petition. You had an online petition, very good. Okay, anybody else? I got one of those posters. You got a poster, okay, very good. That's, that counts, as, I guess, as lifting a finger. Um, so, uh, you know, keep that in mind. So almost everybody knows who this person is, okay? A few people have done something um, about it. Um, yeah, Edgar, let me ask you, what, 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 how were you involved? Uh, I donated some money to the people. You did donate some money, fantastic. I also posted information on Facebook. Okay, very good, thank you. So, as I mentioned, we're gonna talk about social media. So my background is in computer science, but over the last decade, I have done a lot of research in ICT for development um, uh, in all kinds of different areas. Probably over 50 projects in the last 10 years uh, in, in agriculture, governance, education, healthcare, uh, microfinance, using all kinds of technologies ranging from mobile phones to the internet to uh, PCs to <coughs> custom hardware uh, to social media. And um, in, in all of that work, the approach that uh, I've encouraged, uh, especially with my collaborators, is to start off by some kind of immersion where you really try to understand the background, the issues that people are facing, the problems that people might be facing, um, and then spend some time doing design, uh, also with those communities in an iterated way, so we prototype something, try it with people, get feedback, and then repeat. Um, if that goes well, then we move to a phase of evaluation uh, where we do an assessment of the projects to see whether or not they're in fact having the impact that we believe uh, they uh, uh, we believe they're having, and then in some cases we have uh, moved towards implementation either through partners or in some cases even uh, spun off um, organizations that have taken the designed intervention uh, and are trying to scale it up. Uh, all of this is done in partnership with local organizations, whether it's nonprofits or governments. Um, and the idea is that by doing each of these steps roughly in sequence, you can be sure that you're doing something that is uh, relevant, that um, the communities are interested in, uh, and which also has a significant impact. So uh, I'm going to start off with several uh, claims that people make about social media. Yes, you have a question. Sorry, yeah, just going back to the previous slide, um, you, you started with um, methodology and immersion. To what extent does theory or theoretical framework um, play a part in that? It, well, in, I would say it really depends on who I happen to be working with at that time. Some people come with a particular uh, you know, theory that they want to uh, emphasize, and so you know, we'll do ethnography that's based on that theory, look for particular things. Uh, oftentimes it's grounded theory, so we kind of do an inductive thing where you, look, you, know, you try to find things based on what you're actually encountering. Um, it really depends. I, I personally am somewhat agnostic. Uh, I think you can do good work in uh, either, either uh, channel. Okay. Um, so, uh, as you know, sometimes when people think about the Arab Spring, uh, a phrase that comes up is the Facebook revolution. And if you read the news articles uh, about the Arab Spring, they're almost always talking about how Facebook was a critical aspect of the Arab Spring. Um, this is a quote from the New York Times, the Facebook armed youth of Tunisia and Egypt rise to demonstrate the liberating power of social media. Uh, some of these news articles are written in such a way that you think that social media was the sole cause of these revolutions. Um, this is a, a project that is based on Ushahidi, so I believe most of you will be familiar with this uh, API, which basically allows it, you to very easily uh, embed mapping and GIS software into a particular cause. Uh, the original Ushahidi implementation was done for the Kenyan elections where they wanted to find ways to uh, get reports of violence throughout Kenya and put them on a map. Uh, this is for the post-earthquake uh, in Haiti. 
Um, again, Clay Shirky, who is a very well-known uh, pontificator about <coughs> social media, he writes, social media increases the ease and speed with which a group can be mobilized for the right kind of cause. Okay. Um, and then Joseph Kony. So Kony 2012, this was a YouTube phenomenon. Uh, over 100 million YouTube hits within the first week of it being uploaded to YouTube, okay, which is phenomenal. I, I believe at the time it was the fastest, um, most watched YouTube video ever in the history of YouTube. Uh, and that, it might still hold that title. Uh, this is a funny quote from somebody who was actually a supporter of this particular project. He said, even some goofballs from San Diego can change the world using media, the internet, and their hearts. Right? So all of these statements are basically saying that social media in some form have a very strong impact on things like liberating power, the right kind of cause, or changing the world. Okay, and what I want to do is to cast a little bit of doubt on that particular uh, conception of social media. Um, and I'm going to do that by talking about ICT overall. So uh, let me ask all of you, imagine if you and a very poor rural farmer um, were asked to, make, to raise as much money for the nonprofit uh, of your choice, for the NGO of your choice. And you have to do it uh, solely by using a Facebook account <coughs> for a one week period of time to which you had unlimited free access. Okay, who do you think would be able to raise more money? A very poor farmer in, let's say, rural uh, South Africa, or you? Who thinks the farmer? Anybody? Okay, and who thinks you would be able to raise more money? Uh, and everybody else is not sure? Okay, so most people raise their hand for, uh, for the people in this room. Okay, why, why do you say that? We have more connectivity with people who have, let's say, more resources, or know people with more resources. Absolutely. So you have richer friends. Okay, good. What else? Um, I guess like our social networks are already established. The fact that social media is there to help us, you know, get the message out is... Just sure. So you're already facile with social, social media. Good. Who else? Anybody else? Yeah, Kathleen. Well, you know the mechanisms that, you know, others are using, like yeah. the crowdsourcing, like Kickstarters and all those kind of platforms. Okay, so you're more literate in the tools that you could use. Good. What else? Anybody else? Yeah. Sure, so you know who to target, right? Uh, anybody else? Um, what about your capacity to convince other people? Do you think you have more capacity or do you think the average, let's say, fourth grade educated farmer will have more capacity? Probably you, right? Uh, most of you will probably have more organizational capacity. In other words, you have done things where you've tried to bring groups of people together for a particular uh, purpose, um, and so forth. So the interesting thing about this uh, thought experiment is that the technology is fixed, right? It's one week of unlimited Facebook use, um, but the, there's a difference in the people who are using it. And based on that difference, there's a huge difference in the outcome. Uh, so oftentimes you'll hear about how the internet democratizes things, that it somehow levels the playing field and so forth. And what I want to claim is that leveling the playing field is insufficient for undoing the inequality that's already existing in the world. You need to actually change the capacity of the players. And if that's not happening, it's not clear that leveling the uh, playing field by itself is effective as a way to eliminate inequality. So disparities in human capacity and social connections are one of the key reasons for social inequality, which you cannot easily uh, change through technology or through social media. Okay, here's another set of questions. Um, which of the following will have the most impact on making you more physically fit? Okay, and you have to pick one. So A is buying a treadmill, B is promising yourself your exercise every day, and C is hiring a physical trainer. Okay, okay so who thinks A, buying a treadmill? Okay, maybe. Okay, B, uh, promising you, yourself your exercise every day. Okay, many of us have that experience and know that it doesn't work very well. Uh, C, hiring a physical trainer. Okay, so most people believe that. Um, so uh, one of the kind of um, the new, you know the nuances that exists in the uh, in the media about social media is that somehow the technology is contributing the positive force, right? Not just that the technology helps you achieve positive ends, but that it is contributing the positive force. As if if you just have more Facebook, the world becomes a better place. Uh, and I'm going to suggest that that's not the case. Uh, technology certainly creates certain kinds of changes. Uh, there are transformations that happen because of technology, but they're not necessarily the ones that change human beings in a significant way. So this is a cartoon in which there are two people watching a TV show, and it says, 
this looks good. It's a six hour special on how society is becoming more sedentary. Um, uh, and so, you know, the technology by itself can have multiple uses, um, but it may not be the actual source of what changes human beings. And I want, what I want to do is draw attention to the fact that the things that cause change in people are not necessarily technolog uh, technological. Okay, a series of three questions. Uh, this time, hold your hand up if you believe the answer to each one is yes. Okay, so first question, are you as rich as you'd like to be? Anybody? Okay. <laughs> one, one person's quite satisfied with this. Okay. Number two, are you as educated as you'd like to be? Okay, probably in this room, not so much. Okay, one person says yes. Okay, are you as compassionate as you'd like to be? Okay, maybe a couple people. Good. Okay, so now, nobody's answered yes to all, and most of the room did not raise their hand at all. Okay. Now I'm going to claim that all of us in this room already have the information or at least access to the information that is required to satisfy all of these things. Okay? And that is the internet. So if you Google how to be rich, there are over 41 million hits. Okay? Um, not all of those sources are reliable, but somewhere in there, <laughs> there are good ways to increase your wealth. Um, are you as educated like to, as you like to be? Uh, you know, these days there are all kinds of uh, massively online uh, open courses, right? And massively open online courses. And these basically have all of the information that is required for you to gain a degree in just about anything that you want. Um, the fact that you don't, you know, most of you don't believe you're as educated as, as, as you need to be suggests that it's not inf enough to have that information out, out there. Uh, and as for compassion, I found a bunch that are you know, uh, a note from the Dalai Lama on how to cultivate compassion in your life with seven different practices. Um, so again, the information for how to be these things is all there, and yet most of us in this room were not satisfied by the degree to which we are those things. Which suggests that there's a huge gap between the availability of information and the reality of execution on that information. Um, here's a photograph, this man is smoking, and over here there's a sign that says no smoking. Information by itself is an extremely thin cause of changing uh, values, changing attitudes, changing behaviors. Um, you know, in the context of development, we know there's other challenges. Sometimes it's capacity, educational capacity, sometimes it's infrastructure, sometimes it's just availability of money, um, other social support. Uh, all of these things are much, 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 much harder to change than the knowledge that one person has about a particular uh, piece of, um, a particular idea. Uh, and in particular, I want to suggest that information is not the same as education, as we all know, and then social media is not the same as peer pressure, even though we often think that it causes peer pressure. Okay, this time let me ask everybody to start with their hands up. Everybody raise your hand. Okay, and then lower it as soon as you see a question that you believe the answer is no, okay? So the first question, should members of the army have guns? Okay, some people don't believe so, so a few hands have gone down. Okay, should police officers have guns? Okay, most people say probably yes. Should ordinary civilians have guns? No. Okay, most hands have gone down. In the United States, the hands stay up quite a bit. <laughs> um, should five-year-old children have guns? Okay, no hands in this room. Okay, this is a very uh, enlightened room, I'm glad to say. Uh, and I have to have this last question in because sometimes I'm in audiences in which there are people with their hands up even for this question. Should five-year-old children have guns? Should convicted serial murderers have guns? Okay, so here, the technology again is the same. But based on your conception of what is going to be used for and by whom, you have a very different idea about whether that is a good thing or not. Okay, now this is a dramatic example because it's guns, and guns are incredibly powerful devices. But social media is incredibly powerful as well, and so we should imagine that that same principle applies to social media. Um, and I would argue that we already have proof of ICTs having this kind of impact through uh, many of the other ICTs we have already encountered, uh, including television. So in the 1960s, uh, about you know, uh, five to 10 years after I, uh, television became mainstream in the developed world, there was a significant conversation in, among people like us, among people who are interested in development, that suggested that television was the way to solve all educational problems across the world. Okay? In the United States, there were programs in which um, they said, well, we don't have enough teachers, so instead we're gonna put TVs in schools have the students watch TV, and that is going to be their education. Right? Many people thought you didn't have to go to school at all because you could just have TV piping in educational content right into your living room. You will not have to walk to school. Right? Think about the kind of um, you know, the things that people would say. Oh, you know, these kids, they have to walk 10 kilometers to go to school, especially if they're in a rural area. Television solves that problem. Right? Today, we think of television as a way to consume reality TV. You know, most of us 
feel guilty when we watch TV because we know it's probably not the best use of our time. Um, whatever the potential was, the reality is very, very different. And the same, I believe, is true for the internet, the same will be true for mobile phones, and the same will be true for social media, which is to say that um, the negative intentions that we have as human beings are, are also uh, reflected in the, in the ICTs that we use. So let me just read it for everybody. Uh, I believe that the X is destined to revolutionize our educational system. The time may come when X will be as common in the classroom as is the blackboard. What is the full power and vividness of X teaching if it were to be used to help the schools develop a country's new educational pattern? Um, the huge information processing capacities of X make it possible to use them to adapt mechanical teaching routines to the needs and the past performance of the individual student. Okay, so what, do you, what technology do you think X is? Anybody? Yeah. Internet. Internet. Great. OLPC. OLPC. Yeah. OLPC. Anybody else? Uh, Any other ideas? Calculator could be decades ago. The same thing. It could be yeah, decades ago. Uh, any ideas for what the X would be if it was decades ago? Maybe eighteen. A calculator. Yeah. What did you say? Radio. Radio. Great. Great. Okay. So I lied a little bit. These are excerpts from various different documents. Okay. Oh. And in fact, X is cinema, radio, television, computer. <laughs> Okay, now guess what decade each of these was um, made, uh, mentioned. So cinema, anybody? 30s. 40s. 40s, 30s, okay, good guess. Radio? 20s. 20s, okay, television? 60s, 80s, okay, computer? 90s. 90s, all right, so all pretty close. Cinema, 1920, this statement was made by Thomas Edison. Okay. Radio 1945, television 1964, computer as early as 1966. Okay, now what's amazing is that time has passed and now we can look back, right? And we know for a fact that at least the first three technologies have not saved the world, in, not in any significant way. There are lots of great radio projects, there are lots of great TV projects, but on the whole, they have not been the reason why the developing world has become dramatically educated or dramatically more developed. Um, I'm pretty sure we're not going to, in another 20 years, we'll look back and we'll say, well, the PC didn't do it either. Okay, and then if you go another 30 years, my guess is we will say the same thing about mobile phone, tablet, and social media. We don't know, and I'm not insisting that we know for sure, but uh, if you go back to the history of ICTs, um, you know, I think they're a guide. They're, they give you a little bit of uh, ideas. <coughs> now, finally, um, you know, to put, put aside any possible resistance to this idea, uh, let me show you this, okay? So this is a graph of the U.S. Census and the poverty rate in the United States over the last uh, 50 years. Um, this green line shows the rate of poverty in the United States. And what's interesting in the United States is that from the 1940s until about 1970, the rate of poverty continuously declined, okay? And then since then, it has been flat, basically. And then in the uh, recent recession, since about 2007, it's now gone up. Okay, this is one of the richest countries in the world, and the rate of poverty is stuck at 13%. Okay, now what has, what has also happened since 1970? Well, all kinds of technologies have appeared on the scene, right? So the internet, Microsoft, PC, cell phones, uh, uh, Google, iPhone, Facebook, um, this is an old slide, but Facebook, uh, Twitter, um, all of these great technologies have come out of this country, okay? They have penetrated this country, and yet the rate of poverty has not changed much. Okay, so if you believe that the spread of technology, of new technology by itself, is the cause of development and is the cause of a decline in poverty, then you have to ask yourself, how is it possible that the world's technologically most advanced country does not have a dent in its poverty rate during the golden age of innovation? Right? And at the very least, you have to doubt. Okay, so that's all I want you to do is doubt, so that you're not convinced that more social media, more Facebook is necessarily a better thing. Okay, um, so a theory. So uh, those of you who know me, I know that I keep repeating this statement over and over and over again because I firmly believe it. It explains a lot of different ICT phenomena, and that is that technology amplifies underlying human intention and capacity. Um, now, if you go back to this U.S. situation. The reason why this is, I believe, is because the United States as a country is not focused on trying to decrease the rate of poverty much below this point. 
Uh, in fact, there's a very strong voice, you know, there are very strong voices in the United States that actually think poverty is okay because they think it's a way to pre create a certain amount of fear so that people don't become lazy, right? <laughs> so there are people in the country that firmly believe that we should not be trying to eliminate poverty, right? And as a result of that, whatever technology gets built simply serves that underlying social uh, desire. Of course, there are some people who want to eliminate poverty, and those people are working against it, but there are also some people who don't care too much about it, and it all evens out, and so the net result is that the rate of poverty doesn't increase. And that is a fundamentally cultural, political, social issue. It is not a technological issue, because if it was technological, all of this should have caused some change. Um, the other side of it is that technology only amplifies. So one of the things that we often say about technology is that it adds to the situation. It makes things better. And then there are a few people who think it always makes things worse. But very few people recognize that it actually does both. Right? And one of the few explanations for how the same technology can both be good or bad <coughs> is if you believe in an amplification theory. Because amplification means that the de decision to make it good or bad is up to human beings. And then the technology only increases that desire or, or adds to that desire. Right? It's one way to explain why something can be both good and bad. Um, as a theory, uh, I believe it's quite uh, interesting in that it's one of the few theories that allows you to, that is falsifiable. If you find a situation in which you just spread the technology and something good happens when there was no positive intention or capacity to begin with, that would, that would be a, you know, a way to falsify this theory. Um, it also gives you a kind of causal, causal explanation for why ICTs can either be positive or negative, and you, what you need to do is inspect what is the underlying human situation in a particular uh, 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 particular uh, circumstance. Um, it has a number of cor corollaries. Uh, one of my, you know, one of the ones I think is most interesting is that if you believe that technology actually amplifies human forces, then whatever the rate of inequality already exists, adding more technology increases the inequality. Right. So rich people can do much, much, much more with social media than poor people, as you found with the original question. That means that if you spread social media evenly to everybody. <coughs> Richer, powerful people can do more with it, right? So, for example, Bill Gates can, could easily raise a few million dollars, but just by posting on his Facebook account, hey, do any of my rich friends have enough money to support this particular cause, right? None of us in this room have that capacity, and a very poor farmer certainly doesn't have that capacity. So, the technology only increases whatever inequality is already exists. Um, and it also allows you to predict. So, one of the things that you know, I'm always very interested in when I uh, look at ICT projects is, you know, first of all, what was the underlying human intention and capacity that was already there? And does the technology do something that goes against that human capacity or intention? And I have to say, in my 10 years of looking at ICT problems, I have never found it. I have never seen a situation in which people are incredibly corrupt, and you add ICT, and they suddenly become enlightened, you know, selfless. Okay? And I have never seen a situation in which people who are really determined to do something good, and who have the capacity to do it, take on a technology, and then they, they become corrupt in, and in action. It's never happened in, in, in any of the projects that I've seen. So again, you know, you can predict with some certainty if you inspect the underlying human conditions what the technology will do. Uh, not in very precise terms, but in the overall direction of what the technology meant. Um, so let's go back and look at these original claims. Okay, these are the claims about social, uh, social media. So Facebook, okay, Facebook on the use of Tunisia and Egypt rise to demonstrate the liberating power of social media. I actually find this to be an incredibly America-centric interpretation of Facebook. Okay, this is basically Americans saying, we did the thing that happened in Egypt. Okay, <laughs> right? It basically conveniently explains how Americans who really have been supporting this regime in Egypt for a long time, somehow were supporting democracy in Egypt at the same time, and thank it was all thanks to Facebook. Okay? If you actually look to, for, you know, to um, other uh, news sources, and I believe that's true in you know, many of the countries that you come through, this, this uh, idea is not as strong as it is in the U.S. press. In the U.S. press, we are constantly bombarded with this idea. Now, here's the reality. Okay. So, both in Libya and in Syria, um, Gaddafi and uh, al-Assad, within months of protests and rebellion, they turned off the internet in their country. Okay, they shut it off. And then what happened? Okay, who knows what happened? The rebels kept fighting. Yes? The movement continued. The movement continued, right. How did these people organize themselves without this great American technology that is social media? Well, there's always ways to communicate. It's not as if you need Facebook to communicate. 
right? Um, and in fact, great proof of that is the American Revolution itself. Okay, this was a generation in which there was no electricity, no telephone, no telegraph, no Facebook certainly, um, and they somehow pulled off one of the you know most earth-changing revolutions in the history of the world. How did they do it? Well, they used lanterns, right? And if you grew up in the United States, you learned about the story of. Um, Paul Revere signaling, you know, being signaled that you know the the British were coming one way or the other, one if by land, two if by sea. Okay, a trivial, trivial technology for communication, but it served this purpose. Um, if people who interpret the Arab Spring as the Facebook Revolution were to look back and look at the U.S. Revolution, they ought to call this the Lantern Revolution. Okay, it was not Americans who did it; it was lanterns who caused this kind of revolution. And then finally, uh, consider the case of China. Okay, at this point, I believe there are uh, over 650 million um, internet users in China, uh, over close to a billion mobile phone accounts in the country. Okay, if social media, and you know the country has their own versions of Facebook and Twitter and everything else, uh, they're amazingly good at taking other ideas and then re-implementing them in the country, and they do it much better than the original. So you know, all of these internet users all have Facebook accounts. Or they could, okay, uh, by your accounts. Now, if you believe that social media is the cause of revolution, okay, this is a highly totalitarian, oppressive country. You know, where is the revolution? <coughs> it's not, again, it's not because social media caused the revolution. It's because there are underlying political forces. For the most part, people in China are reasonably happy with their leaders. Okay, um, they are not unhappy with their economic situation. For the most part, some of that is changing, but it's changing because of socio-economic conditions, not because of widespread uh, use of social media. So if you put all of these things together, what you realize is that social media is neither necessary nor sufficient to cause revolution. And if you believe that, you have to, again, you know, doubt the idea that social media is a cause of revolution. Right? It might be an assistant, it might be an accelerator, but it is not a fundamental primary cause. Okay, so uh, Ushahidi and, uh, and other such technologies. Um, Facebook. One of the things that's known about social media increasingly is that the more you use it, the more depressed you become. At least for a certain uh, age group and a certain uh, class of uh, students for which this kind of study has been undertaken. And people suspect that the following phenomenon is at play. Uh, most of us, when we post to Facebook, we post all of our good, happy, little bit, you know, you recently did badly on your test, and you're feeling a little bit bad, and you go on Facebook. Well, all your friends are either having a good time or doing really well. And you think, my gosh, only my, I'm alone in my misery, okay? So you feel even worse, even though the reality is that people are having an equally difficult time. Um, but that's not what you see on uh, Facebook, right? But spreading that is one cause for that. Um, in the United States, uh, you know, people talk about the left wing and the right wing, uh, Democrats and Republicans, and what's interesting is that in an age in which we now have more choices for absorbing news and commentary, uh, all of the people who are left-leaning tend to watch Jon Stewart, who's a comedian and who is always uh, making fun of the right-wing. And all the people who are right-wing tend to watch Glenn Beck, who is a right-wing commentator and always making fun of the left-wing. Okay? Um, so the underlying split in the country is not being addressed by the existence of media, of more media. Right? In fact, the more channels we have, the less we have a common experience online. And therefore, the less we are likely to even understand what the other person is uh, is hearing on a regular basis. Uh, when I, you know, when I was growing up in, the, uh, in both in Japan and the United States, you know, these countries had maybe four channels. Okay, so you could not but avoid watching the same news that the rest of the entire country is watching, and at least you had the same sense of what that news was. Okay, every once in a while, I like to watch. You know Fox News, which is the right-wing news on, on the United States, and you know it is an alien language as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> you know I do not understand what they're talking about, but half of the country completely, you know, engages in that language, right? So we are growing apart as a country, even though there are more choices and more ways to connect. And finally, you know there are lots of situations with social media where um, you know bad activities end up online. So cyberbullying is a major problem in the United States, where uh, almost on a you know, monthly basis, um, you know, some some teenager, you know, kills themselves or causes some kind of great harm because the bullying that used to happen offline is now creeping on online, and you can you can never completely connect yourself from that social world. Okay, so let's talk about Kony. Um, number one, uh, one of the things about the hundred million number is that people say, well, you know, we could never have reached a hundred million people if it wasn't for social media, and that's definitely true. 
But behind every such uh, success, there's always an initial kernel of actual person-to-person -person engagement. And one of the things that's really inter interesting, if you look at if you look at the history of Invisible Children, which is the group that put out this video, is that for a little over 10 years, they spent a lot of time engaging with students and student groups on college campuses and on, at high schools, building up a community of people that would support them and their work. So that when they put their YouTube video out, all of a sudden, all of these people who they had connected to on an individual basis um, started tweeting, and that. Tweeting is part of the thing that generated the 100 million YouTube hits. Um, let me ask all of you this question. So of all the people that you are friends with on Facebook, uh, would you say that the, you know, how, how many, do you believe that those are people that you have met in person, or are they mostly friends that you have, that you have made through social media, but have never met in person? Mostly met. Mostly you met in person, yeah. yeah right? Okay, okay everyone yeah, agrees, right? Sure, I, I regulate. Yeah, some people are very, that's right, so some people are very, you know, strict about that. They want to make sure their friends are real friends, yeah. okay? And then some people like me are somewhat easier and we're looser, and so we'll happily accept as friends anybody who's going to be a friend. Um, but the reality is, even for me, okay, even for me, the group of people that I primarily am thinking about when I post anything to my Facebook account are my friends, right? It's not that the social media has suddenly actually generated more friends, or at least not significantly. Um, it's mostly that it's just a way to keep in touch with uh, the friends that I already had at um, another side of Coney. So, you know, just as with the issue of poverty in the United States, 100 million YouTube hits, and what's happened with Coney? Well, Joseph Coney is still out there, okay? And uh, my guess is uh, out of those 100 million YouTube hits changed that foreign policy simply because 100 million people watched a particular video. And that situation is the same. The only way to get this to change is to really engage with the government, engage with policymakers, engage with members of Congress, um, and a lot of that will require uh, either face-to-face -face or direct uh, interaction. And that's the reason why, um, again, in the United States, people talk about lobbyists as being a significant force. And what do lobbyists do? They have face-to-face -face dinners and lunches, and they go and talk to Congress. Okay. Um, and finally, uh, you know, one of the issues with, you know, uh, with, the, with the Coney video is that, you know, um, how many people here believe that Joseph Coney is the, sign the sing single most significant development issue that the world is facing today. Okay? Nobody, as far as I can tell. Right? Um, now, you might believe that it is an issue that we should worry about, but there are plenty of other pressing issues. Maybe you think it's malaria, maybe you think it's uh, uh, gender equality, maybe you think it's, you know, what, what, what are people in here working on? HIV. HIV, great, yeah. And what else? Education. Education, good. Right? All of these things make, matter much more than the fact of a single person, however tragic uh, the situation is with Joseph Cohen. Um, we don't want to become a society in which decisions about how to invest our resources are made on the basis of how successful you are as a marketer. Right? But that's exactly what we are gradually becoming by allowing more and more of the conversation to happen over social media. Right? So what, who is successful in social media is people who are very, very good at marketing, people who can get celebrities involved. Uh, uh, people who can um, tell a great story, but those are not necessarily connected to the most important issues of the day. And so we need some other mechanism to do this, and I would argue that uh, social media is not necessarily the best thing to do that. So all of these issues are, again, one reason why you know, we have to be very careful with what we expect. And I would say in each of these cases, what you see, again, is an amplification effect. So you know, the fact that uh, if you're interested in reaching out social media, you need to have some core uh, real um, social network to, uh, to amplify. Um, if you're interested in causing change through social media, there needs to be some existing political movement that you want to amplify. Um, and then finally, you know, the social media naturally amplifies the capacity of people to market things. And so we have to be very careful that it's not amplifying other things that might be more important. So recommendations. Um, uh, again, starting with this idea that technology only amplifies human intended capacity. Uh, the flip side of this is that for technology to have positive impact, the right intent and capacity has to already be there. Okay? If you don't have that, there's nothing to amplify, or at least there's nothing positive to amplify. Um, and so what does that mean? So if you, are, you know, the, if you are working on an ICT project, the best way you can guarantee having positive impact 
is to go to a place where there already is an existing social trend that is positive and helping amplify that. Uh, I believe M-Pesa's rural remittances are an example of that, right? So there were many Kenyans who were already sending money back home uh, through various other channels, and then M-Pesa arrived on the scene, and they said, oh, this is easier and cheaper, why shouldn't I use that? So it helped in that case. Um, or you work with an existing organization uh, that is achieving some social end. And that, I think, is you know, one thing that I you know, wish every technologist you know, at ICTD would emphasize when they're trying to achieve uh, technology, uh, uh, impact through technology. Um, oftentimes, if you have a strong organization that's already achieving a particular end, then you can find a way to help them do it better. And that's, again, an amplification, right? The one thing, what doesn't work, is to believe that you just put the technology out there and then magic happens. Uh, for all the reasons I've been talking about. Okay, and then uh, conversely, let's say you're not necessarily constrained to using ICT. Then I think there's many other things that, uh, approaches that you can take. Uh, among them are, if you start with the problem first, then oftentimes the solution has nothing to do with ICT. But if you're imagining that ICT has to be a part of the solution, you're effectively shrinking the space of effective solutions and leaving out many other solutions that might work. Um, and then the other one that I think is the most critical one, which uh, I'm thankful that you know, there are organizations like Spider uh, around, which is that everywhere we need more human capacity. Um, and that capacity is sometimes has a value associated with it. So for example, you know, I think the United States as a country needs to change the way that it thinks about its approach to, to the world. And that change needs to happen separate from any technological development. Um, without it, it doesn't make a difference how good our technology is. We will continue to do the wrong. Uh, and since this is a group of you know, people doing research, you know, let me suggest these are um, several very high level questions that you could ask about social media uh, as a researcher. Um, you know, one is, assume, let's suppose that you believe the amplification theory, right? Then there's lots and lots of questions that still follow from that. For example, what kind of application, ad, amplification actually happens over social media? Uh, is it amplification, you know, does it accelerate communication? Does it add to the number of contacts that you have? And if so, by how much? Does it change the intensity of impact that, of anything that you're doing on a regular basis? Um, you know, these are things that I don't think we've asked enough. Uh, we, talk, we tend to talk about whether social media is good or bad or can help or can't help, but we don't get into the next level questions. Another one is how do social media networks and real social networks relate? So as we saw you know, when I asked the question earlier, most of us, our, social net, our, our online social networks reflect our offline social networks. Um, but there's always a little bit of an extra bit, right? Uh, you know, most of us have some, we know somebody on Facebook that we have not yet met in person. Um, the question is how do those people, how do we get to interact with those people and how do you choose who those people are? Um, and does it ever lead to an online interaction? Uh, all of these kinds of interesting questions. Um, another, quest, another line of questioning is what kinds of development focused actions can be expanded over social media? Right, so you know, once again, 100 million YouTube hits for uh, Joseph Kony, much of it through social networks. My guess is that, you know, uh, only a small fraction actually did anything to try to uh, help uh, capture Joseph Kony as a result of that campaign. Right, so an obvious question is, um, is what kinds of actions can you expect people to take if they encounter it over social media? Right? And what's the percentage of the conversion? Or what's the rate of conversion? Or what are the elements that cause that conversion to happen? Um, all interesting questions. Uh, another one is, you know, is it easier to accomplish a certain kind of social change through social media than other kinds of social change? And then finally, uh, is there such a thing as critical mass for attitude changes? Um, so peer pressure, I believe, is a very strong social pressure. Uh, again, if you have friends who believe a certain thing, it's very hard to continue to resist them. Um, and that's the same is also true on social media. But is there something that happens on social media uh, that changes these things? Um, one of the things that's interesting is, so um, my, uh, one of my brothers lives in the Midwest of the United States, and he lives in a town in which there's actually very good representation of both the left and the right politically in the United States, in the country. Uh, and his, social, his Facebook page is always interesting because if anybody ever posts a political statement, there's a strong you know, immediate reaction to it on both sides. You know, which for some reason doesn't have, you know, I, I live in a part of the country that tends to be very left-leaning to begin with. And so I don't see that as much on my side. But on his page, it is constantly happening. So one question is, is there a point at which some of these things tilt 
right? Do people actually change their minds as a result of what they perceive on social media? And I don't think we have any sense for these ideas. You know, we talk again about how social media changes everything, but we don't yet know the degree to which and how it does. So those are the kinds of research questions that I think would be interesting to uh, pursue. And then a lot of them um, have relevance in the context of development. Uh, so to summarize, uh, I talked about you know several different uh, ways in which the the um, the you know the press and news media talk about social media, uh, in, especially in context of development. Um, I went through several myths about ICTs. Uh, myth number one being that the internet democratizes, or that technology is the cause of positive behavior, or that information is the bottleneck, or that technology's impact is always positive, or that technology acts will save the world. I suggest all of these statements are wrong in some in some particular way. Um, you know, I presented this idea that technology amplifies human intent and capacity, and that that leads to a number of recommendations. One of which is that you always want to focus on positive human capacity and intention first, and then find a way to use technology to amplify that. So thank you. Very much.